Hello, and welcome back to the CMCC Mechanochemistry Discussions. I'm Ashley Martini, and I'm happy to be here today to introduce you to today's discussion speaker. So just as a brief intro, Mechanochemistry Discussions is hosted by the NSF-funded Center for Mechanical Control of Chemistry. The goal of the seminar series is to bring the community together. We're streaming, usually live, perhaps not today, but new seminars are available on the third Thursday of every month at 10 a.m. Central. We have an excellent slate of speakers for 2021 already lined up and we're about halfway through and we're excited for you to participate in all of these. Before we get started, a few thank yous. First, to Dr. James Batiste, the director of the CMCC, to Jennifer Belsick, the administrative coordinator of our center, and to three CMCC students, Noah Sheehan, Sergio Romero Garcia, and Quintarius Moore, all of whom help make this seminar possible. Thank you very much for joining us as part of the seminar ser series. Please feel free to join us and follow us on YouTube and also on Twitter. Lastly, as I alluded to earlier, although usually our seminars are live, today's seminar was pre-recorded. However, if you have questions, please feel free to email us at cmccdiscussions at gmail.com and we will forward your questions along to the speaker who has promised to follow up. Finally, without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Wendy Mao. Dr. Mao received her BS from MIT, PhD from the University of Chicago, and a J.R. Oppenheimer postdoctoral fellowship at Los Alamos National Laboratory. She joined the faculty at Stanford in 2007, where she is currently a professor in the Department of Geological Sciences. Her research group focuses on the experimental study of the behavior of materials under extreme environments with application to understanding earth and planetary interiors and developing new energy related materials. So welcome me in uh, thanking Dr. Mao for participating and thank you for participating in our seminar series. So thank you for this opportunity to participate in this mechanochemistry seminar series. Today I'll be talking about opportunities for synthesizing and studying new materials and understanding their behavior under pressure. So why do we care about pressure? Well, Ava Zurek already introduced this nicely in her talk in January, so I won't belabor this introduction too much, but I did want to emphasize a few things. Pressure is a fundamental thermodynamic variable that can be used to induce profound changes in materials. Graphite transforms to diamond with the application of high pressure and temperature, and the properties of these two polymorphs of carbon could hardly be more different. The different structures for graphite versus diamond result in a soft, opaque semi-metal versus a super hard, transparent electrical insulator and fantastic thermal conductor. In the Earth's mantle, silicate rock forming minerals undergo a dramatic coordination change from tetrahedrally coordinated silicons to octahedrally coordinated silicons with depth. Pressure also greatly complicates and enriches the behavior of water with about two dozen stable and metastable forms of H2O having been reported. If we look at the periodic table, at ambient pressure, the elements shown in yellow are found to be superconducting at low temperature. At high pressure, the elements in purple also become superconducting, nearly doubling the number of elemental superconductors. The goal of our experimental approach is to help address scientific questions about materials at high pressure. These questions can be relevant to a wide range of fields, from earth and planetary interiors, to condensed matter physics, solid state chemistry, and material science. To address these questions, we need to study the behavior materials at appropriate conditions. For questions relevant to planetary interiors, for example, this means measuring relevant compositions at high pressures and temperatures. To study these properties, we need to use appropriate tools. This includes static and dynamic techniques for getting to high pressure and variable temperature, and then coupling these extreme conditions with a suite of in-situ probes and also looking at the quench products using ex situ probes. The results then feed into models and interpretations, which lead to refinement of the questions and cycling through this loop. So progress in experimental work really depends on technical development. So this bin is critical. 
But I do want to emphasize that the technical developments are science driven. It should link back to the science, scientific questions. Oh, and I'd also like to mention that this picture, this is a picture of Slack National Accelerator Laboratory, which is just down the street from Stanford campus. This is a view looking down the three kilometer uh, linear accelerator. So SLAC, like other Department of Energy National Labs, offers some unique and state-of-the-art user facilities for conducting experiments that would be beyond the resources of an individual PI scale, like synchrotron and X-ray free electron laser facilities. Okay, so how do we reach extreme conditions experimentally? The main tool our group has been using to reach high pressures and variable temperatures is the diamond anvil cell. This operates under a very straightforward principle. You apply force to the back of two gem quality diamond anvils that are compressing on a sample contained in a gasket. Since pressure is force per unit area, you can generate very high static pressures on the very small sample that's squeezed between the two diamond cubits with only a modest application of force. With a diamond anvil cell, you can access a large range of pressure and also vary temperatures by using a cryostat to go to low temperatures and either laser or resistive heating to go to high temperatures. We can access all the conditions within our planet down to the inner core using a laser heated diamond anvil cell. The diamonds you use are generally about one, one fourth of a carat, so the sample is very small. You then need a probe that, which can give you an appreciable signal and penetrate the high pressure vessel. Another advantage of diamond is that besides being the hardest material known to man, diamonds are also transparent to a large range of electromagnetic radiation. So they make good windows for a variety of optical and x-ray techniques. The diamond anvil cell cells themselves are also quite small, uh, pocket sized, making them highly portable. So we can make measurements in our in-house laboratory. And then we, well, we used to be able to take the same cell in a car or on a plane to fly to different synchrotron X-ray facilities. Now, since we aren't able to fly to our experiments due to COVID-19, the small size of diamond cells still means we're able to ship the cells and conduct remote experiments. And actually that's what, that has worked really well. My group currently has run more than half a dozen remote synchrotron X-ray experiments. And I've been very impressed with how the different X-ray beam ones have really ramped up and made remote access possible. Um, it'll also be really interesting to see what role remote capabilities will continue to play once we return to whatever is the new normal. So we often want to integrate many different measurements to characterize what is going on in our sample at high pressure and variable temperature. So characterizing the sample is like the story of the blind men and the elephant. So six blind men were trying to describe what is an elephant like. So one touched the elephant's tusk and said, oh, an elephant is like a spear. One touched the elephant's trunk and said, oh, an elephant is like a snake. Um, the elephant's ears like a fan. The elephant's um, side is like a stone wall. The elephant's legs are like the trunks of thick trees. The elephant's tail is like a rope. So individually, these um, observations would give you a very skewed view of what the elephant is like. But taken together, then you actually get a pretty good picture of this Frankenstein elephant, right? So similarly, we often, want, we often need to make many different measurements in order to really understand what's going on in our sample at extreme conditions. Fortunately, a large suite of synchrotron X-ray techniques have been adapted for use at high pressure. Also optical measurements and electrical and magnetic measurements. Neutron work in a diamond cell is more limited since you generally need much more sample volume, but there has been progress here and you can use larger volume presses um, for if, your experimental, if your experiment calls for more moderate pressures. And while theory and simulations are not experiments, they are quite complementary, as Ava had presented in January. It can be very important for making predictions and interpreting experimental results. Um, I also want to note that you can generate extreme conditions via dynamic compression, but this slide is basically all I'm going to say about this during this talk. So you can generate shock waves, which are supersonic disturbances in a material that produces a finite jump in pressure, uh, pressure temperature, density, and particle velocity in the sample. You can use um, magnetic fields, gas guns, and also lasers to generate shock waves in samples. 
So this is a picture of one of the laser scientists at the Matter at Extreme Conditions end station at the LINAC coherent light source. So this is the X-ray free electron, this um, X-ray free electron laser facility at SLAC National Accelerator Lab Laboratory. And he's working on some optical parts that are part of a high power laser system, which is used to generate very high pressure uh, dynamic compression, sorry, dynamic conditions, and are then coupled with ultra fast X-ray characterization. So a lot, a lot of very exciting progress has been made into conducting in situ ultra fast X-ray diffraction spectroscopy and imaging during dynamic compression. And this is a very exciting direction. And I would encourage you to check out the LCLS website for more information and links to recent work being conducted there. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so I'll be sending the rest of this talk presenting some, presenting some examples of new materials that form under high pressure. So let's first take a look at an earth science question our group has been working on. What happens to volatiles in our planet's deep interior? And let's take the look, let's take the case of what happens with iron plus water or iron plus oxygen at the conditions inside our planet. These are pretty important and basic starting materials, which are also very abundant in the Earth. I'll just remind everyone that iron is the most abundant element by weight in our planet, and oxygen is the most abundant element by number. So at low pressure on the Earth's surface, iron and water react to form hydrated iron oxides and iron oxyhydroxides like gerthite, like gerthite, F-E-O-H and iron plus oxygen react to form iron oxide. So this picture of rust forming on the Titanic. If we go a bit deeper into the planet, we can look at previous results on the reaction between iron and water in the Earth's mantle. Uh, so down to mid lower mantle conditions of 60 GPA and 2000 Kelvin, it was previously found that iron and water react to form wustite, which is FeO, and um, iron hydrogen. Beyond these conditions, the behavior of iron plus water was previously not well explored. Well, presumably, there might not be new reactions if we go further down to the core metal boundary. Also, there would be many questions about how water could even get down to the lowermost mantle and what form it would take. And then furthermore, reaching the extreme pressures and temperatures of the deepest parts of the mantle in the labs in the lab setting are not trivial. However, in the past, decade, the technical challenges in conducting experiments in the megabar or 100 GPA regime coupled with laser heating has become increasingly accessible. So Jean Liu, who was a postdoc in our group, decided to look at iron and water down to Earth's core mantle boundary conditions. In agreement with previous literature, he found that at more moderate pressures, so below 80 GPA, iron and water react to form FeO and FeH. But at pressures above 80 GPA, an unexpected reaction occurred uh, and he found a new oxygen-rich hydrogen-bearing iron peroxide, so FeO2H phase, formed along with FeH. And you can see um, the reaction product in this X-ray diffraction pattern on the right. The hydrogen content in this phase ranges from x equals zero to one, depending on the pressure and temperature condition and the hydrogen content in the source. Please also note that <clears throat> this new phase is more oxygen rich than FeO. Okay. So this new hydrogen bearing iron peroxide has the same cubic crystal structure as pyrite, which is iron, which is iron sulfide, FeS2, um, also, it forms these beautiful golden, um, FES2, the so pyrite, forms these beautiful golden cubes um, and other cubic crystal, and it's known as fool's gold. And if you think about um, the periodic table, oxygen sits right above sulfur. So it may not be so surprising that the structure is the same as FES2, with oxygen replacing sulfur in the lattice. The structure also can accommodate vari variable amounts of hydrogen, where the hydrogen atoms sit in between oxygen dimers, between different iron oxygen octahedra. You can also synthesize hydrogen-free FeO2 from hematite, so Fe203 plus oxygen. 
all and all of these iron peroxides have the same uh, pyrite structure. <clears throat> so what about the oxidation state of the iron and oxygen in this compound? So Gene collected X-ray absorption spectra of the new hydrogen bearing and the hydrogen free versions of the iron peroxide for different pressures and for a number of iron uh, standards. And here's a plot of the first derivative of the absorption edge, iron absorption edge. <clears throat> the peak of the iron peroxide phase lines up very well with Fe2+, so ferrous iron, compared to more reduced FeO um, zero or more oxidized Fe3+, or Fe4+. Theoretical calculations from collaborators are also consistent with these experimental results. The valence state of iron in the hydrogen bearing iron peroxide is close to plus two. This is due to the increased oxygen oxygen interaction, with oxygen having a valence state close to minus one. So the pyrite crystal structure imposes structural constraints over the positions of the iron and oxygen, and thus influences the oxidation state. So despite having a higher oxygen to iron ratio than hematite, so two to one iron oxygen to iron ratio, you actually have more reduced iron and more oxidized oxygen in this, in this material. Okay. So coming back to our picture of iron in water in the, at lower mantle conditions, we now have investigated the entire range of pressures and temperatures in the mantle and at, you know, down to the core mantle boundary. And we have a new, where we have a nearly infinite reservoir of iron in the outer core that could react with any water that might be able to get, make it down that far. Mm. But is there any evidence for iron peroxide near the core mental boundary? Well, seismology provides us with our obser main observations of the Earth's deep structure. And near the core mental boundary, a number of very interesting features have been observed. So ultra low velocity zones, and large low shear velocity um, provinces, which are characterized by increased density and a variable depression in shear and compressional sound wave velocity. So there's been a number of hypotheses that have been proposed for explaining these very strange features at the core mineral boundary, near the core mineral boundary. But what about iron peroxide? Well, we we know we need to know. Um, if whether or not the sound velocity and density of the space in order to see whether they could match seismic observation. <clears throat> so uh, Jean Leo determined the density and sound velocities for the hydrogen bearing iron peroxide phase using X-ray diffraction coupled with another synchrotron X-ray technique called nuclear resonant inelastic X-ray scanning. And what, what did we find? Well, compared to the preliminary research, sorry, preliminary reference earth model, PREM. So this represents a 1D average model for velocities and densities in the planet. Found that the <clears throat> shear wave velocity um, of the iron peroxide phase is actually 40% lower. The compression wave velocity is 20% lower and the density is 20 to 30% higher compared to average um, uh, lower most mantle. So for ultra low velocity zones, mixing about 50% of the hydrogen bearing iron peroxide with 50% of average mantle would give you velocities and densities that are consistent with uh, seismic observations. And for large low shear velocity provinces, adding about five to 10% of the hydrogen bearing iron peroxide phase would match seismic observations. So this of course doesn't prove that this phase is being formed at the core mantle boundary. And it doesn't prove that, th that the, this phase would explain um, ULVZs or um, LLSVPs, but it is another possibility for explaining the, these unusual seismic features that have been observed. So to quickly sum up what, where we currently are, we find unexpected chemistry in the ion water system at deep mantle conditions. Um, this new iron peroxide phase means that we might have iron and oxygen with multiple valence states in different lower mantle phases. And this iron oxide phase, <clears throat> sorry, iron peroxide phase is also a possible candidate for ultra low velocity zones and large low shear velocity provinces. But ultimately we want to get at questions about volatiles in the earth, like what are the hydrogen oxygen carriers in the deep mantle? 
and how are hydrogen and oxygen stored and cycled throughout the Earth? And to answer these questions, we really need to continue to conduct more experiments at high pressures to study what chemistry can occur under the extreme conditions within our planet. Okay, <clears throat> so now moving on, we can also apply these high pressure tools to material science and really open up the periodic table where we find lots of very interesting chemistry that can occur at high pressure. So I just wanted um, to present a few examples, a few quick examples. Um, so when you look at um, the high pressure behavior in binary systems containing hydrogen plus other simple molecules, you can find many interesting new and unexpected crystalline compounds. There's really too many binary systems to mention that have been previously studied. Um, hydrogen plus nitrogen, hydrogen plus oxygen, hydrogen plus argon, hydrogen plus silane, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. In all of these binary systems, they, um, you, you form novel crystalline compounds when, subjected, when they're subjected to high pressure. And here I'll just I'll briefly show some examples of some, some of the things that I've worked on. <clears throat> and I'll mention um, the hydrogen plus water system where you form at least three different crystalline compounds at high pressure. And one of them um, is hydrogen class with a clathrate structure um, in an S2 clathrate structure where water forms cages around molecular hydrogen molecules. In this S2, um, hydrogen clathrate with S2 structure, the hydrogen to water ratio is one to three. And this clathrate forms under fairly modest pressures. So less than two kilobar or 0 0.2 GPA and 250 Kelvin. <clears throat> if we look at the hydrogen plus methane system, there's at least four crystalline compounds that have been discovered. The most hydrogen rich one of these is methane with four hydrogen molecules. <clears throat> so this four to one um, hydrogen to methane ratio is equivalent to 33.4 weight percent molecular hydrogen. So this is not including the hydrogen in the methane. So this um, methane with four hydrogens forms at um, pretty high pressure, well, pretty moderate pressures, but um, technologically pretty high pressures, six GPA at room temperature. Um, but you can also crystallize it to much lower pressures, so 0.3 GPA or three kilobars if at uh, liquid nitrogen temperatures. And I just mentioned this because um, in terms of applications, hydrogen has been touted as a promising clean, air, clean energy carrier. But one of the major limitations to a hydrogen economy is how to store hydrogen, especially for mobile applications. So these hydrogen-rich materials have very high hydrogen content, both by mass and by volume, and they have environmentally friendly byproducts. But of course, these synthesis conditions is still an issue. Um, but these materials can also may also provide some insight into hydrogen interactions, and they can afford to lose quite a bit of their hydrogen capacity if that is able, if that improves their synthesis and storage conditions. I say also hydrogen, water, and methane are very abundant molecules in our solar system and in the universe. So they may be relevant, also relevant for understanding planetary ices. ices. <clears throat> okay, our group has also been looking at carbon-rich materials. So these include diamondoids. Um, so a diamondoid is a cage-like Ultra stable saturated hydrocarbon with carbon carbon frameworks that's, that is superimposable on a cubic diamond lattice. And these uh, diamondoids are all terminated with hydrogen atoms. So diamond, diamondoids are found naturally in petroleum. The smallest diamondoid is adamantane, and it's composed of a one cage unit. Dimantane is composed of two fused diamond cages. And then trimantane is three fused cages, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the lower diamondoids. Higher diamondoids above trimantane um, can all have structural isomers. So the same composition, but different arrangements of atoms. And a lot of the behavior of diamondoids actually lies in the transitional regime between organic molecule, organic hydrocarbons and um, a bulk diamond. So um, what we found with diamondoids is that they're a good starting material for making diamond. So these are figures from a, a paper published last year where the lead author was Sulgi Park, who was a graduate student and then a postdoc in my group. The lower diamondoids actually transformed a diamond at pressures and temperatures as low as 12 GPA and 900 Kelvin. 
These are pretty modest conditions, especially in temperature, um, considering no catalyst is involved. We also found that the diamondoid to diamond conversion occurs within 20 microseconds, and that diamonds, diamondoids with a linear geometry form diamonds at lower pressures and temperatures, and actually trimantine had the lowest barrier to form diamond among the, um, the number of diamondoids we studied. Diamondoids and other uh, rigid cage molecules can also offer some exciting, um, sort of exciting and interesting mechanochemistry opportunities. So our group has been collaborating with Nick Malosh in the Material Science and Engineering Department at Stanford and his former postdoc, Cao Yen, who is now an assistant professor at the University of North, North Texas. So in this paper in uh, 2018, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, molecules with mechanically heterogeneous components, so um, ones that contain a uh, compressible or soft uh, mechanophore and incompressible ligands that were engineered. And so these schematic diagrams show that in the molecular anvil case, isotropic stress leads to relative motions of the rigid ligands. So these are shown with the red arrows anisotropically deforming the compressible mechanophore and activating bonds. So, um, and then allowing reactions to occur. So example of this is um, M boring, sorry, M carboborane nine thiolate. So this is a sh this shows this molecule, um, with this engineered um, a molecule here, which has the carborane, rigid carborane molecules, and then this soft um, core, C, uh, a carbon four, sulfur four, four. And then also another example is um, sil uh, silver one, um, uh, sorry, uh, silver one diamantine uh, one, sorry, silver one diamant diamantine one thiolate. Um, so in these cases, bending of the bond angles or shearing of adjacent chains activates the metal calcogen bond and it leads to transfer of electrons from sulfur to the metal cation and the formation of elemental copper or elemental silver. In contrast, the heat-driven reaction involving the same react reactants would, would yield cuprous sulfide in the case of this um, copper compound, <clears throat> not elemental copper. So on the right, we show um, shown a schematic case for another uh, for a steered blockage case where the motion of the rigid ligands is blocked by their stair propulsion. So this protects the mechanophore from deformation and blocks reactivity. So then um, also study a couple a few examples in which this is the case, and we do not and in these cases even with pretty high um, pressures we, we don't see redox reactions. <clears throat> so um, very quickly, I want to give one more carbon example of using pressure to synthesize desirable functional material. This is very simple conceptually. So this is looking at graphene nanoribbons, which you can think of as strips of graphene. <clears throat> so unlike graphene, graphene nanoribbons are semiconducting with a tunable band gap based on quantum confinement and edge effects. So this leads to some very attractive electronic properties compared to graphene. However, the reliable production of graphene nanoribbons, especially ones with narrow bandwidths, um, remains a significant challenge. And so we collaborated with a faculty member at Stanford in chemistry, Hongjie Dai, who is interested in using carbon nanotubes, which can be synthesized much more easily as a starting material to then form graphene nanoribbons. <clears throat> it's a pretty straightforward idea. You just um, squash the nanotubes. Um, a visiting scientist, a Zhang, Zhang Xing Chen and my graduate student Fan Yang compressed solutions of carbon nanotubes up to pressures of 20 GPA and indeed found that at high pressure, you can flatten the tubes into nanoribbons and that the nanoribbons can then be quenched and recovered back to ambient conditions. So here's a TM image of the carbon nanotube starting material where the edges of the nanotubes are out of focus because of the curvature of the tube. <clears throat> and then once you flatten the nano ribbon, once you flat, flatten the nano tube into a nano ribbon, the entire ribbon is in focus. <clears throat> the best condition so far for synthesizing and then covering the nanotubes is 20 GPA. 
and we get a pretty high proportion of these nanoribbons. So up to 54%, about 54% of single and double walled carbon nanotubes can be converted in, into edge closed graphene nanoribbons. And this is really good yield. The problem is, of course, well, there's a number of problems. So besides high pressure is that you don't have much starting material. So you also, you don't get much product despite the good yields. So it's still exploring um, more, more variable pressure temperature conditions and also adding other components to the starting solution. <clears throat> Our group has also been focusing on other function materials for energy applications, including halide proskites, which represent a family of materials that generate intense interest due to their potential for optoelectronic applications specifically photovoltaics. So this structure is um, based on our familiar oxide proskite structure. And halide proskites like oxide, prox like oxide proskites are attractive because of their flexible chemistry, which provides opportunities to modify the physical and electronic properties. They also have very compressible lattice lattices. They're softer than oxide proskites, which results in a dramatic response to properties under um, compression. So we've been collaborating with Hemamala Karinadasa from the chemistry department at Stanford to look at haloprospects and related compounds. Her group has, has been synthesizing starting materials, which then go into high pressure experiments. An insight from our high pressure studies can then inform synthetic design of new and improved materials, inspire the next set of experimental studies of their behavior high pressure. So in one of our first studies, Adam Jaffe, who was um, Hema's graduate student and is going to be starting as an assistant professor in Notre Dame this fall, looked at a two-dimensional copper chloride hybrid proskite. And upon compression, he found that the material underwent dramatic piezoprosum um, from a starting material that was translucent yellow that then turned red around 4 GPA and eventually became opaque black. Um, we also saw five orders of magnitude increase in conductivity from seven to 50 GPA. <clears throat> and this is due to at elevated the elevated pressures enhances the d orbital overlap, and then this um, re partially relieves the orth orthogonality of the half filled d orbitals. And with sufficient orbital overlap, this enables that electronic connectivity. And this was the first instance of appreciable connectivity being observed in a copper to chloride proskite. So to follow up on this result, Adam then replaced the chlorine with bromine and found a conductivity of 10 to the minus three Siemens per centimeter, which can be obtained in layered copper bromide um, proskites at only 2.6 GPA, so fairly modest pressures, with the highest conductivity of 10 to the minus one Siemens per centimeter square being measured at about 60 GPA. So this represents a six order of magnitude increase in conductivity with moderate pressure in the copper, uh, copper bromine versus the copper chlorine proskite. And this dramatic improvement in pressure and these properties can be attributed to a more sensitive structural response to mechanical compression and the increased orbital overlap due to the higher energy and more diffuse bromine orbitals relative to the chlorine analogs. This also brings pressure induced conductivity of 2D copper halide proskites to more technologically accessible pressures. So this is the last example I'm going to mention, which is from work that was published at the beginning of this year. So postdoc Fonke uh, found, um, he found that by exploring a number of pressure and temperature paths, he was able to preserve a desirable proskite structured cesium lead iodide phase that was formed at high pressure and temperature. He was able to quench it back to ambient conditions. And that this phase was robust in terms of not decomposing back to the more thermodynamically to the thermodynamically stable non-proskite phase. And this represents a promising strategy for manipulating the phase metastability of halide proskite for, synthes for synthesizing desirable phases at variable pressures and temperatures um, that have the enhanced, uh, enhanced materials functionality and then preserving them back to ambient condition. Now those, these conditions are still high pressure um, they're actually fairly modest, if you imagine just a few kilobars. And so you can imagine synthesizing much larger amounts of this phase, although not in a diamond cell, obviously. <clears throat> okay, so finally, I just want to re-emphasize that pressure is a powerful tool for 
uh, greatly expanding the field in which we can look at new phases and normal ph novel phenomena. What I mean here is that over different pressure ranges, you have the same elements, but you may find altered chemical and physical properties. So what's exciting is that we really only barely scratch the surface of this very exciting field, and there are many opportunities to find new materials at high pressure. <clears throat> So I need to acknowledge my research group, both past and present at Stanford, and also the many collaborators that made this work possible. And of course, the funding agencies, um, which has supported this work. So this is um, our most recent group photo that we were able to take together in person. So this is from a holiday gift exchange in January of 2020. And then this is just two months later in March after the shelter in place orders in California. Um, it's pretty hard to believe that we are over a year into the pandemic, and I just really wanted to finally encourage everyone as we continue to try to manage all the challenges during these difficult times. I also really want to wish everyone good health and well-being um, to everyone out there. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, please feel free to contact me if you have any questions or like PDFs of any of the studies that, you've men that I've mentioned. So thank you very much. Thanks so much to Dr. Wendy Mao for that excellent presentation. And thank you for joining us. Please subscribe or follow us on YouTube for the mechanochemistry discussions. The CMCC has an excellent slate of speakers lined up for 2021, and we look forward to having you join us for future seminars as part of the CMCC mechanochemistry discussions.